Hello and welcome to the Berean Voice. I'm Randy Seaver. We're continuing to study Romans chapter 10. What we're seeing there is that Paul is unpacking some of the ideas that he has brought brought up in the ninth chapter. And um, two of those ideas are running concurrently throughout this entire passage, Romans chapter 10. The first idea that Paul sets forth is the idea that Israel has fallen because of unbelief. Uh, Israel has fallen because they rejected the stone that God laid in Zion, a proved stone, a precious stone, a, a sure foundation. Uh, and instead of uh, seeking righteousness by faith, they sought righteousness by obtaining or trying to obtain righteousness by keeping the law. Uh, and we see that set forth in the last verse of this chapter, where, uh, in, pardon me, chapter 9, where he says, uh, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Now, was this intentional on God's part? Is this what God intended to occur all along? That is, did God intend to judge Israel, blind Israel in part, and bring in the Gentiles? Is that Was that God's purpose? And I think the answer is clearly yes. And chapter 9 has told us that God had the right to do that. We know that this must have been God's intention because it was prophesied during the Old Testament period. And we see these two passages that, uh, that Paul brings together, the first out of chapter 8, verse 14 of Isaiah, and the second in chapter 28 of Isaiah. And then Paul brings these two verses together in verse um, uh, 33 of Romans chapter 9, and he says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And, and it's very clear from the prophetic scriptures that this was God's intention. Now, does that mean that God deliberately caused the Israelites to stumble at this stone? That is, did God put the unbelief in their hearts so that he might damn them? And the answer, I think, is very clearly no. We've already talked about the whole idea of equal ultimacy. God does not need to cause sinners to sin. Sin comes out of our corrupt natures. And so he says, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And then the second part of that is, And whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You'll recall that this was... Um, often predicted in the Old Testament scriptures. In fact, we see it in the prophecy of Joel. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How did the apostles understand that? And the answer is the, the apostles understood that as the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's purposes of mercy. That is, they understood that to mean that people from every nation, whoever they are, wherever wherever they have been, whatever they've done, no matter what, if they call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And so we have these two ideas running uh, concurrently through this passage. We have the idea that God is, is sovereign in the dispensation of his mercy, uh, that God's intention all along was to judge Israel and include the Gentiles. This is not something that happened as an afterthought. God didn't say, whoops, I didn't expect this, and so I'm going to have to go to plan B. Uh, believe it or not, there are people who are actually suggesting this of God, that, that God uh, sort of knows things contingently, and if uh, things don't go exactly one way, then God can punt and go back to plan B or go forward to plan B. And, um, you know, in reality, they, they have to believe that because if they realize that if God knows perfectly what's going to occur and creates the world anyway, knowing what would occur if he did, then God is by his act of creation determining what is going to occur. Uh, now, does that mean that um, God's foreknowledge or God's omniscience of things future is causative? And the answer is no, it doesn't cause the event to take place. But what we have to understand is that neither does God's decree or God's predestinating determination cause everything that occurs. 
Uh, God is not the proximate cause of evil. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he does not tempt any person, any man. And, and James goes on to say, but every man is tempted. And so we see how he's using this word tempted. Uh, it, could be, it could be translated tested, but uh, he, he, he is using it in terms of temptation. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away, when he is t- enticed by his own desires. And so the idea of temptation here is God does not entice sinners to sin. God does not put the uh, idea of sinning into our hearts. If we sin, we are responsible for that sin. Does that mean God has not determined to permit that sin to accomplish his purpose? Obviously not. And this should be very clear from passages like this. Did God intend, because we find God saying, this is what I'm going to do, uh, in the Old Testament scriptures, did God intend that Israel would be judged and the Gentiles would be included in his pale of mercy? And the answer is, of course God intended that. God predestined that. Now, does that mean that God caused the ungodliness of of Israel? Does that mean he caused their unbelief? No. No. God, we read in the last verse of chapter 10, God says he was always stretching out his hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Um, This was God's stance. God is always extending his arms of mercy. It is the sinner who is the one who stubbornly rebels against God and suppresses God's truth in unrighteousness. You see, Paul asked the question in chapter chapter 9, why is it that the, Israel, that, that the Israelites who were seeking after righteousness have not obtained it? And his answer is because they did not seek it by faith but rather by the by the works of the law. And so in chapter 10, we see him setting forth these ideas uh, in terms of uh, two different methods of justification, uh, one which does not work for sinners, but which, which the people of Israel imagined could make them right with God. And so he quotes from Moses, Moses saying, the one, the man who does these things shall live by them. But then he contrasts Uh, that method of justification, which doesn't work for sinners, with the message he is preaching. And he says the problem is the Israelites were trying to be put right with God by their own works, by their own obedience. They thought that somehow they could make themselves right with God by keeping the law, but they misunderstood that that the law was pointing them to this precious stone that had been laid in Zion. But rather than understanding God's method of putting sinners right with himself, they were going about to establish their own method of putting themselves right with God. Uh, It is the ultimate do-it-yourself scheme. This is always the way sinners left to ourselves are going to try to devise our own method of justifying ourselves before God. It may be that it's simply devising a plan by which we can cooperate with God and help him to accomplish his purpose by exercising our free will. But you see, that's that's just a natural tendency of sinners. Rather than submitting themselves to God's way, we tend to want to do it our way. And that's what Paul's setting forth here in this chapter. And so he contrasts this this idea of being right with God by law-keeping and being right with God through faith. And he does that in verses 5 uh, and um, through, through 8. What does it say? Verse 8, the word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. What must we do? that we must confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord or the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead. As we saw, these were those two truths that the people of Israel were rejecting. They rejected the idea that Jesus is Lord, that God has already sent down the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, uh, 
from heaven. They don't need to ascend into heaven to bring him down from above. They don't need to, to descend into the abyss to bring him up from the dead. God has already accomplished that. God has done everything that is necessary to make sinners right with himself. All you must do is believe. And so they had stumbled at that stumbling stone because they did not recognize that the Old Testament scriptures are a book about Christ. They are all pointing forward to him. He is the goal for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so uh, that's the first idea that Paul is pursuing. The second idea that Paul is pursuing is that because Israel has stumbled, stumbled through unbelief, God is now taking out of the Gentiles a people for himself, a people for his name. And, and so we find one of the emphases in, in the, this 10th chapter, the idea that whoever will believe, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This was often repeated during the Old Testament scriptures and the whole idea that, that the Gentiles were, were going to be brought into the, into the tent so that the tent of God's mercy needed to be enlarged. We see that very clearly set forth in, in uh, Isaiah 54, uh, Isaiah 52 and following, uh, even passages surrounding that are really, first of all, talking about the return of captives from Babylonian captivity and what God was going to accomplish. He has, he has cast them off into, the, uh, into bondage, into captivity, and now he's going to bring them back. He's going to restore them. But this, like the exodus and the redemption of the people of God out of Egypt, is a type or a foreshadowing of God's accomplishment of redemption according to the terms of the new covenant, which we are, have, have now become partakers of. Um, and so Paul is justified in using these, this terminology that's found in, in Isaiah 52, 53, and so forth. He, he's justified in using this terminology that has to do with the type and shadow to talk about what has now been fulfilled in terms of the fulfillment of the new covenant. This is what Jesus was talking about in, in John 6 when he said in verse 45, uh, they shall all be taught of God, as it's, as it's written in the prophets. Where is that? Well, it's Isaiah, Isaiah 54. It's written in the prophets. They shall all be taught of God. What in the world is he talking about? Well, he's not talking about the mere outward hearing of the gospel. What he's talking about is the manner in which God now, according to the terms of the new covenant, is writing his law in our hearts. He's causing us to desire to be pleasing to him. How does that happen? Does that happen by the exercise of free will? Absolutely not. That happens by the exercise of sovereign mercy. And we're, we see that very clearly set forth in the New Testament scriptures. Um, but, but this is what he's talking about in Isaiah 54 <clears throat> when it says, They shall all be taught of God. <clears throat> Every member of the New Covenant community is to be enrolled in God's school under his instruction. And then Jesus says, every man therefore who has been taught by my father comes, or who has heard, or heard and learned from my father comes to me. This is what is necessary for sinners to be made right with God. You'll never ever decide by the power of your free will that you're going to submit to God's righteousness. You're always going to be going about to establish your own righteousness. Uh, but what he goes on to say is everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Well, first of all, we need to ask the question, what does he mean by the name of the Lord? And ju in just a moment, I want to come back and clarify so something I said in the last video that may not have been completely clear. 
But before I do that, I just want to talk about what, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Well, throughout the scriptures, when the name of the Lord is mentioned, it is the Lord himself who is in view. When the name of the Lord is spoken of, it is talking about God and all of his glorious attributes. In other words, we, we call on God for all that he is when we call on the name of the Lord. It's likely that in this passage, he's talking about calling on the name of the Lord Jesus, who is, in, who is himself very God of very God. And so let me just read to you from uh, uh, Robert Haldane's commentary on Romans on this passage. And what he says here about the calling on the name of the Lord is this. Here, as in other places of Scripture, the name of the Lord signifies the Lord himself. By calling on the name of the Lord, all the parts of religious worship which we render to God are intended. It denotes a full and entire communion with God. He who calls on the name of the Lord profoundly humbles himself before God, recognizes his power, adores his majesty, believes his promises, confides in his goodness, hopes in his mercy, honors him as his God, and loves him as his Savior. It supposes that this invocation is inseparably or inseparable from all other parts of religion. To call on the name of the Lord is to place ourselves under his protection and to have recourse to him for his aid. And Paul says, whoever in this way calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul is saying, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you call on the name of the Lord, you are certainly going to be saved. Listen to what he says here in this passage. In verse 12 of, the, of Romans chapter 10, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call on him. For whoever, and notice that in the context he's talking about whoever, Jew or Gentile, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let me just say something about the word whoever, or whosoever, as we find it in the old King James Version. There are many, many people today who believe that whenever they find the, the word whosoever, in the scripture that it always refers to every single person without exception. And one of the things we need to understand is that when we find this word whoever, uh, which is not really found in scripture, usually it's something like the ones believing, the ones calling, or something of that nature. But whenever we find that word, it is always um, attached to a verb. For example, whoever believes, whoever calls, um, because the, the word is sometimes whoever rejects the word. Uh, and so it can't refer to every single person because every single person does not reject the, the revelation of God. Every single person does not believe. Uh, it's amazing how many people think that uh, uh, John 3.16 is talking about everyone. But it isn't talking about everyone. It's talking about God's purpose to save those who believe. It is in order that uh, everyone believing in him should not perish. It has nothing to do with God's purpose for those who are not believing in him. But you see, whosoever is put together with believing in him. And so it's important that we consider that as we look at this passage. Another thing we need to consider as we look at the passage is that Paul is not talking in this context about regeneration. It's amazing how many people want to look at this passage and say, well, see there, a person has to believe before he can be regenerated. But if you look at the context of the passage, it's very obvious that Paul is not talking here about regeneration, but he's talking about righteousness. He's talking about justification. And so what he's saying is, you're going to be justified if you believe. He's not saying you're going to be regenerated if you believe. We have to understand these things in the context. Now let me just clarify before I go on. Uh, I mentioned the last time that I think that the emphasis of the apostle when he says that, that we need to um, confess that Jesus is Lord, 
or confess the Lord Jesus. The emphasis is not on confess that Jesus is Lord, but the emphasis, it seems to me in this context, is on confessing that Jesus is Lord. Because this is exactly what the Jewish people had denied, and it is the stone over which they had stumbled. They had refused the idea that Jesus, this one who was born of Mary, and they would be willing to say his, whose father and mother we know, uh, this one could not have come down from heaven as he is claiming, because you recall in John chapter 6, he says, I came down from heaven not to do my own will. But they said he didn't come down from heaven. We know his father and mother. Uh, and so and so, what uh, these Jewish people are now being called on to confess is that, yes, Jesus is Lord. And I don't mean to indicate by that that we do not, in coming to him, have to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. That's certainly clear. But my point is that in terms of the context that we find here and what the Jewish people had denied, and and you you recall that Paul says, don't say who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring him down from above. He's already come down from above. Or who shall descend into the abyss, that is to bring him up from, from from the dead. Uh, You don't need to do that. God has already done that. There's nothing left for you to do. God has done it all. That's the point he's making. All you must do is believe. And the promise of God in the scriptures is, whosoever, Jew or Gentile, who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then, of course, uh, he, he talks about no distinction between Jew and Gentile. That was a tough pill for the Jewish people to swallow. This is why we so often in the New Testament scriptures find the words all and and world. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him. What what does that mean? Well, there was this Jewish exclusivism that was rampant in that day. and, and, And the Jewish people were thinking, do you really mean that God is now extending mercy to these Gentile dogs in the same way he has extended mercy to us? And the answer is yes. He did not come to condemn the world as you thought. He came for the purpose of saving the world. Does that mean it was his purpose to save every single person in the world? No. How do we know that? Well, if if that had been his purpose, then God would have accomplished the purpose. He does, according to his will, in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Uh, That's very clearly set forth in Scripture. To deny that is to deny the God of Scripture. And then he goes on in Romans chapter 10. um, Question is, what is my purpose in writing? Keep in mind the purpose of the apostle in writing this epistle. What is it? It is to explain and justify his Gentile mission. Why must he preach to the Gentiles? Well, he brings up the question in verse 14, how then shall they call on him whom they have not, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how, how shall they preach unless they have been sent? These are important questions. Does God redeem and bring to faith his elect people, apart from the preaching of the gospel? I've heard uh, primitive Baptists say, uh, yes, there are people who will never hear the gospel, who, whom God has elected from before the foundation of the world. It doesn't matter whether they ever believe or not, whether they ever hear the gospel or not, um, God is going to save them. And, and many of them look at passages like this and just go through all sorts of contortions to try to get rid of the plain teaching of the scripture. But Paul says very clearly, no one is going to call on him if they have not believed on him. And no one is going to believe on him unless they have heard him. And no one is going to hear him without a preacher. Now, by the way, uh, we are often told that um, Jesus draws everyone to him because he has been raised up uh, from the earth on the cross. 
And so he is now drawing everyone. And so that kind of trumps uh, chapter 6 of John, where, you know, he's clearly setting forth another idea. But, um, you know, Jesus draws everyone without exception. And my question for you, if you are one of those folks that likes to quote that verse, my question for you is this. If God draws everyone to, to Christ, or if Jesus draws everyone to himself because he's lifted up from the earth to the, on the cross, uh, then can you tell me how it is that everyone is drawn to him? Are they drawn to him apart from hearing the gospel? And this verse says they are not drawn to him apart from hearing the gospel. They are not going to believe on him if they haven't heard him. They're not going to hear him if they haven't been had the gospel preached to them. And they're not going to have the gospel preached to them unless someone is sent to tell them the gospel. Or you say, well, he's simply talking about God's manifestation of himself, his revelation of himself in the creation of the world. The problem with that is Jesus is making their being drawn contingent on his being lifted up, first of all, to the cross, and then from by, by means of the cross to the throne of glory. And he says if that happens, and only if that happens, that is a condition for this to happen, only if that happens will I draw all men unto me. And so it has nothing to do with people were being drawn um, or, or people were, or were seeing the revelation of God in the creation, even apart from Jesus being lifted up on the cross. B but the, the drawing or that he's talking about is, is a drawing that is contingent uh, on his being lifted up. That is, unless he is crucified, he is not going to include these Gentiles uh, in the gospel purpose. Keep in mind, the context of this is there were certain Greeks who were seeking him, and, uh, and Jesus doesn't even answer the question when, when his disciples come to him and, and advise him of this, these Greeks who wanted an audience with him. But he simply says, unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. What in the world is he talking about? Well, what he's talking about is the fact that he has to die in order for these Gentiles to be included. And so instead of saying he will draw everyone without exception individually to him if he's lifted up, what he's saying in that verse is, if I'm lifted up, I'm going to draw all peoples to myself. I'm going to draw people from every nation. Well, he has already said in chapter 10 of John, verse 16, other sheep I have who are not of this fold, this fold of Israel, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. This is going to happen. But it's not going to happen apart from his being lifted up from the earth. And so it's very clear that if a person is going to be uh, saved, then that person must hear the gospel. And that person is not going to hear the gospel unless that gospel is preached to him. And if that a uh, person is going to have the gospel preached to him, then someone is going to need to be sent. Now, who sends them? And the answer is, God is in control of the means by which he accomplishes his purpose as much as he is in control of the purpose itself. And so what Paul is saying is, I'm preaching the gospel to these people because they are not going to be converted unless they hear the gospel. But then he asks the question, verse, verse 18, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now, the passage from which he's quoted is, is Psalm 19. And in that passage, he's talking about the heavens that declare the glory of God and the firmament that show his handiwork. In other words, he's talking about God's general revelation that is given to all without exception. He's talking about God's revelation of himself in the things that he has made. And so what Paul is saying here is that, yes, they have heard, they have, they have, they have had the word witness to them, the, the revelation of God witness to them, but though the, this revelation is sufficient to condemn them if they do not accept the revelation uh, that God has given, it is not sufficient to justify them or for them to come to faith. 
And so he says in verse 19, but I say, did not Israel know? That is, does not, did not Israel know of the purpose of God to uh, use them uh, or, or use the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy? Listen to, listen to what he says. I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, and I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of those who did not seek me. He's quoting here from, from Isaiah 65. Uh, and and both, both of the quotations we'll be looking at have come from Isaiah 65. The first is, I was found of those who did not seek me. I was made manifest of those who did not ask for me. He's talking here about the Gentiles. These are those who are not seeking uh, after righteousness, but now have obtained righteousness. And then he says, also quoting from Isaiah, Isaiah 65, but to Israel he says, all day long have I stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Notice what he's doing here. He's saying this was the purpose of God. It was the purpose of God to um, bring in the Gentiles and to provoke Israel to jealousy by bringing the Gentiles into the fold of his mercy. But even though this was the purpose of God, God's desire for Israel that is clearly set forth throughout the Old Testament scriptures, calling on them to repent, stretching out his hands of mercy to them, beckoning them to him, um, that, that um, uh, rebellion of Israel against Jehovah was Israel's fault. It wasn't God's fault. And this is the stance that we always see God taking towards sinners. It is God who's always stretching out his arms. It is, it is God who is inviting sinners, upbraiding sinners, rebuking sinners, uh, promising mercy to sinners who will repent. Sometimes I think people go wrong in, in looking at passages in which uh, judgment is being pronounced and uh, trying to get rid of the whole idea that God desires and the, 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 the repentance of sinners and would, would um, pardon them if they repented. That's what Jesus is doing, I think, in, in his pronouncement of judgment on the, the leaders of, of Israel in, in Matthew 23. Uh, we don't need to try to get rid of that passage because it has nothing to do with, with the determination of God to do what he was about to do. What it has to do with is the fact that he is saying to them, if the people had repented, and if you, leaders of these people, had repented, but you would not, then I would have forgiven you. I would have gathered you to myself as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing for protection. But you refused. The problem is not that God would not. The problem is that they would not. Now, does that mean that they thwarted the purpose of God, the decree of God. No, this is what God had intended all along. But what it means is that their fall was their fault. They were being judged because though they had heard prophet after prophet after prophet, and they had stoned them because they did not want to hear their message, keep in mind what Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and have killed those who have been sent unto you, how often, and keep he's looking back to verse uh, chapter 21 where he's talking about the, the wicked vine dressers who killed the prophets, uh, how often I would have gathered you. I was sending you messengers, one after another after another, and you rejected the message. This is your fault. This is the message Paul is bringing. If you have fallen, Israel, it is not because God has decreed that you fall. Ultimately, that was the, the reason. Yes, 
But whose fault was it? Did God cause you to fall? No. God was extending his arms of mercy to you. Let me say this to you. If you're still outside of Christ, don't ever think about blaming your lost condition on the decree of God. God does not cause you to be lost. If you're lost, you're lost through your own fault. The only fault is your free and wicked will, to quote A.A. A. Hodge. I hope this has been clear. This, this is not an easy passage to look at, but um, I, I think it's very clear that what Paul is doing is he's saying even though God has the right to sovereignly determine what he's going to do, God is not at fault if you are guilty of rejecting the stone that Jehovah has laid in Zion. If you stumble over that stone, you stumble over that stone by your wicked unbelief. You see, we, we don't have to dismiss either idea. Either God is sovereign or people act freely. Those ideas are set forth in scriptures, and we, we must believe both of them. If we reject either of them, then we are guilty of misusing the scriptures. Think of Peter on the day of Pentecost. He says to them, um, him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Can you just imagine these people saying, wow, whew, I thought we were guilty. N now we know this was what God had determined to happen all along. I'm glad we're off the hook. But Peter doesn't stop there. Peter says, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You are guilty. Did God determine that this was going to happen? Was this his decision? Absolutely. We see the same thing in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. Both Herod, Pontius Pilate, uh, the Gentiles, the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined beforehand to be done. Are you guilty? Yes, because you did exactly what you wanted to do according to your highest inclination, and therefore you are culpable. Did God determine that you would do what you would do before he ever created the world? Yes, absolutely. Both of these truths are clearly set forth. Don't be guilty of denying either one of them. Well, I hope this has been clear. If not, leave comments in the comment section. Um, I have no way of knowing whether you are getting what I'm trying to say or not unless you comment. If you have questions or comments, please leave them below. If you have, have objections, I'll be happy to try to answer your objections, but I can't know what they are unless you tell me. Well, until next time, may God richly bless you.